Hi, welcome to our webinar, What is Academic Family Medicine? So for a little bit of context, my name is Dr. Natasha Bouillon. I'll be facilitating your webinar. This webinar is put on by the STFM Faculty for Tomorrow Task Force, which is sponsored by the STFM Foundation. This is the first of eight webinars in a webinar series that hopes to support fellows, residents, and even medical students as they think about a career in academic family medicine. So our STFM task force is created by these people, so you might recognize some of their names, and they're the ones who helped put together the content for this webinar. Our webinar today is going to be focused on what is academic family medicine, and we'll answer participants' questions and give you an overview of academic family medicine. Our panelists today are myself. I'll be serving as the facilitator. My name is Dr. Natasha Bouillon. I recently graduated from residency last year, and now I'm a family physician and the medical director of one medical group. I also have a faculty appointment as assistant um, clinical professor at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. And in that context, I precept with medical students. And I will let Dr. Annie Rutter introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Annie Rutter. I'm from Albany Medical College in upstate New York. And um, I'm part of this task force um, in two roles. One is I'm a medical student education director, which means I run the third year clerkship and fourth year courses for our, um, Albany Medical College. And I'm also part of our um, university-based uh, residency faculty, uh, where I work with the residents that are affiliated with the medical college as well. And like Natasha, transitioned to this role directly out of residency and have um, been in this this current role for the last uh, five years. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Rutter. We also have Dr. Rob Freelove, and I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, yeah, I'm Rob Freelove. I'm from Salina, Kansas. I'm the program director of the Smoky Hill Family Medicine Residency Program. I'm in my 10th year as program director. I served as a faculty member at that program for, or at this program for three years prior to that, and actually joined right out of residency myself. Um, I also have a an appointment as a clinical associate professor with the University of Kansas School of Medicine in Wichita, which is the university with which our residency program is affiliated. Uh, and I am the CEO of our, of our clinic, which is a federally qualified community health center. Great. Well, thank you so much for both um, being here. So just to let our attendees know, if you have any comments or questions during the webinar, please feel free to use our integrated dialog box on your right to submit those questions. You can submit them at any time. And our um, admin team, they'll be going through those questions and we'll be answering them live during this webinar. Uh, just a little background for who is part of this webinar. So we did a pre-webinar survey of some of our attendees. We found that 56% of you are female, 44% are male, and we have all levels from medical students to faculty who are attending this. 75% of people who are attending said they would like to pursue a career in academic family medicine, although we also have a majority of people who are undecided regarding fellowship. But 50% want to pursue a career immediately following residency, such as what many of us did. Um, people seem pretty confident in maintaining a healthy and enjoyable life outside of work. Some of the fears that we did see as themes is some people said that they were worried about being accepted into a position. They're worried about the academic requirements that it takes to maintain a position. And other people expressed concerns about the lack of available positions in their geographic areas, all of which we will address today. I will let Emily and Sarah take over our poll. So we would love if you can go ahead and answer if you are currently a medical student, resident, or fellow, faculty at a medical school, faculty at a community residency, or if you're a non-faculty physician in practice, just so we know who's joining us today. And everyone filling in their votes. We're just going to give a few more seconds so that we can get all of the answers. All right. Let's share these results, everyone. So um, majority of people here are resident or fellow. We do have 
some faculty from the medical school and faculty from the community residency programs. So 63% are resident or fellow, 25% are faculty at a medical school, and 13% are faculty at a DME or community residency. Great, thank you so much. And just for full disclosure, this session is being recorded and it will be available after we are completed so you can send this to anyone that you work with as well. So just for starters, I would love to hear from our panelists a little background on academic family medicine. So right now, we know that the demand for people enrolled for academic family medicine is high and it's only increasing. I would love if um, Dr. Freelove, can you chat with us about what changes in academic family medicine you anticipate are on the horizon. Sure. I, I, mean, I think, uh, as you said, it's, it's the, the demand for it is increasing, and I only see that growing. I think a lot of the changes in academic family medicine really are dependent on the changes uh, in, the, in medicine in general, um, as there's a push towards um, paying for value and quality as, as opposed to fee for service. We're going to have to be teaching residents um, different skills um, in addition to medicine and how to take care of patients, but how to do quality, quality assessment, quality improvement, how to monitor outcomes, how to use team-based care and, and um, their, their electronic medical records, things like that, to, to try and to provide a high quality of care. Um, I think those are some things that, from an academic standpoint, we're going to have to shift our teaching a little bit. Um, that also, I mean, I think there's more recognition of the importance of primary care. There's certainly an a growing demand for primary care, especially family medicine. So, like, like you said, that, that demand is increasing, and I think will probably only continue to increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And Dr. Rudder, because there is such a demand, we'd love to, one question we kept getting is, why do physicians want to do academic family medicine? So can you elaborate on some of the benefits of being in academic family medicine? Sure. So I think one of the main reasons is that people are drawn to teaching, and that's sort of the backbone of academic family medicine is passing knowledge on to sort of the next generation of, of physicians. And whether that's at the pre-med level, medical student level, resident level, or even doing faculty development or continuing medical education, I think that teaching and working with learners is something that you'll find academic family physicians are extremely passionate about. But in addition to that, one of the other benefits that I've seen personally is being able to practice full scope family medicine, which is something I went into residency choosing to do, but being able to do that in a setting where I wanted to live, where family was. Um, and so there are certain parts of the country where full scope family medicine is um, able to be practiced because of the demands that a residency or medical student faculty um, have, and, and that's a good thing. So being able to, to do that. Um, when you've kind of um, poll faculty members or poll others who are doing academic family medicine, some of the reasons that people say they're interested in teaching and interested in academics is because it helps them stay up to date. Um, it helps them um, have the opportunity to give back to the profession a sense of service, which is a lot of the reason why people go into family medicine to begin with, but also the opportunity to do research and give back to the academic growth of our discipline. And then, you know, one of the lifestyle things is flexibility of schedule. So thinking about seeing patients in clinic, you know, seven to seven every day versus time for teaching, time for academics, time for research, time for quality improvement, um, and having flexibility of schedule. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, you know, even among the three of us, we see the diversity of what an academic role can look like, and it can be, you know, really spread across the spectrum. So just starting with Dr. Freelove, can you elaborate on what the role looks like in terms of the traditional role for clinical faculty in the community-based residency. Sure. So in uh, community-based residency, really, your primary functions are clinical teaching. Um, so there's a lot of uh, at the bedside teaching. There's a lot of precepting. Um, you do have some didactic and workshop, that kind of stuff. But really, it's, it's primarily that clinical teaching. So there's a lot more hands-on. There's a lot more uh, direct um, uh, teaching, at, like I said, at the bedside or in the procedure room, that sort of thing. Um, it's a little, little different flavor, I would say, than probably um, a university setting. Having said that, I've only ever been in a community-based community, community -based residency program, so um, I'd be interested to hear probably how uh, that, uh, 
how Annie thinks that um, differs in the university setting. Yeah, so I think... Yeah, Dr. Roger. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> so I was going to say, yeah, that's a perfect segue. So from a university setting, I think there's still um, quite a few of the same things that Dr. Freelove mentioned. The bedside teaching, the clinical teaching is a big part of what we do, particularly in the day-to-day. -day. Still part of my main part of my job is seeing patients and caring for patients. It's just very often I have a learner with me or I'm um, the, the resident or the student is seeing the patient and I'm working with, with that person. Um, I think the university setting changes things in that there are um, some other expectations and or opportunities for uh, faculty physicians and that they're part of potentially a large group setting, although both um, uh, Natasha and Rob talk about their um, working within a health setting, health system, but a university health system. Um, but we also talk about um, working in small groups, whether that's with med um, medical students or teaching in other kind of venues in addition to the clinical teaching. So classroom-based, lectures, didactics, workshops, um, but then also um, research expectations and, and other things like that can be a little bit different in a university setting. And I can also, I can chat about having a faculty appointment. So I actually, my full-time job is in a private practice, but I have a faculty appointment. And so it's really interesting because on weekends and after hours, I'm able to teach medical students in different settings like healthcare for the homeless or in future workshops. And so the mentoring component is still there. I'm also able to help out with, you know, medical school. They'll have different clubs and activities, and so I can help out in, in that role as well. And then also just serving as that mentor figure for med students. So I'll often be asked to help with reviewing their personal statements or looking at their CV. And so I think having a different perspective where I'm able to balance private practice but also being part of faculty and working with medical students is really rewarding. So in terms of what the traditional work settings look like, um, I think you guys talked a little bit about this, but Dr. Freelick, can you kind of emphasize, like, what are the settings that a community-based residency faculty might be working in, in addition to just their clinic? Sure. Um, I guess I would first say that if you've seen one family medicine residency program, then you've seen one family medicine residency program. Um, there's a lot of variation, a lot of different variables that go into that, but um, in general, community-based programs, um, they're, um, a lot of them are independent, so they're, they're kind of standalone. They have affiliations with the hospital, so you spend a fair amount of your time in the hospital providing care on the inpatient wards uh, or on L&D delivering babies, um, in the emergency room, in the OR, those kind of different places. Um, they can also be community-based but hospital-owned, so it could be uh, an outpatient clinic or branch of the hospital or a, a larger health system. Um, in, within that, you can have uh, community programs that are uh, university affiliated or not. Um, probably the majority are university affiliated, and with that, um, it just depends on distance and what that affiliation looks like as far as how much you might be responsible for teaching medical students and, and doing things at the medical school. But in general, in a community-based program, you're going to spend most of your time in the Family Medicine Center um, or in the hospital. Yeah, and that definitely makes sense. Dr. Rudder, for you, what have you seen the setting look like for university-based faculty? And really, what are the major differences? Yeah, so I think the first thing to point out is the similarities, um, sort of what Dr. Freelove said, that we've got you know, the opportunity to work in a family medicine center. So we're still seeing patients. I think there's sometimes a misconception that a university-based um, faculty practice looks a little bit different, but I'm still able to see families. Um, I'm still able to see patients that are my own and my own panel. So I think that's a really important thing. It just it might look a little bit different, um, but overall still caring for families, which is a big tenant in family medicine. But I think one of the differences that we see is um, really what types of learners we're able to work with. So at, at certain points, you're going to have um, residents, but also a big majority of what I do is work with medical students. And so that might be in the third and fourth year in a clinical setting. But again, some of my other responsibilities um, are to work with them in sort of the first and second year in the preclinical times, learning about evidence-based medicine, clinical skills, um, doctoring courses, things like that, that there's an opportunity to work with them in kind of both settings um, that's right in my backyard. And I think Natasha 
Natasha, you talked about that as well, sort of in your experience, that as a, having a faculty appointment allows you that flexibility to do that too. I think when you're um, paid and on faculty at a medical school, that's part of um, the expectation that's sort of negotiated up front is what is your um, job description going to look like and what's the balance between clinical learning and um, a slightly different um, academic setting, small groups, large lecture, things like that. Mm -hmm. I could just yeah, and that. it seems like... Go ahead. I'm sorry, but yeah, I, I don't want to, I guess I don't want to give the impression that when you work in a community-based residency program, you're not going to teach medical students. Um, you probably aren't going to teach a lot of um, first and second year medical students, uh, depending again on proximity to the university you're affiliated if you are. You may get some third year medical students through, um, but you know, it's generally more fourth, fourth year students um, or students who are doing electives or selectives specifically with your program. So there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with that individual student. There's generally not as many students around, but, but there's still a fair amount of medical student education that goes on in community-based residency programs. Definitely. And so what I'm mostly hearing is that, you know, a commitment to academic family medicine, really the biggest part is the joy of capturing learners in different stages of their education. And in addition to that, there's the component of scholarship as well. Um, you know, Dr. Freelove, can you just chat with us about what are some future leadership or career development opportunities that our attendees can often work towards? Um, in a residency program, I think um, from a career opportunity standpoint, the, the general progression there is from a faculty member to associate program director or assistant or whatever they, whatever that program, how they deem that, and then eventually towards program director if that's the route that people want to go. But I also think that um, having a faculty appointment in a residency program is kind of a springboard um, to appointments at university settings. A lot of program directors go on to become uh, chairs of family medicine departments or uh, designated institutional officials for their university, and that's the person who kind of oversees all of graduate medical education within within that system. So, and then from there they can, they can go on and advance in the academic ranks if that's the direction they choose. But I think it also facilitates the opportunity to be in other leadership opportunities. Um, a lot of faculty end up being medical directors uh, for their clinic or chief medical officers in the health system. Um, maybe they're the, the chief of staff at the hospital, um, director, director roles overseeing clinical quality, patient safety, clinical research, those sort of things. Um, and then I think even beyond that, it's if you look at the leadership in sort of the organizations in the family of family medicine, like the American Academy of Family Physicians or state chapters, the Association of Family Medicine Residency Directors, FTFM, even AMA and local and regional, uh, local and state medical societies, a lot of those leaders are people who have a job in academic family medicine. Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty amazing, the roles that we play. Yeah, if you stop and, I mean, stop and really look at who, who are those leaders and um, a significant portion of those leaders have come out of academic family medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Dr. Um, Rudder, we actually got a question, and this is a very difficult question to often answer, but one of our attendees asked us, what exactly is full scope family medicine? So. I would love to hear, Dr. Rudder, starting with you, your opinion of the definition of full-scope family medicine. Sure. So for me, when I think about full-scope family medicine, it really um, appeals to the clinical side of me. So it's looking at all of the different things that are part of um, family medicine residency training. So that includes hospital-based care, outpatient care, outpatient procedures, potentially inpatient procedures, delivering babies, rounding in the newborn nursery, or any combination of that, working in nursing homes, doing home visits. So really um, looking at what the training in family medicine provides and then being able to continue to um, provide those services to patients um, in in kind of my professional setting, being able to do that. I think there are definitely people who would add, and certainly I would consider maybe the patient, the panel uh, panelists today would think that being a part of um, academics um, and 
um, medical director or these other things are also part of full scope, but typically when I think about it, I really think about utilizing all aspects of my clinical training. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely, that makes sense. And going back to the teaching opportunities, Dr. Freelove, just in terms of what the precepting experience is like, can you chat a little bit about what it's like to precept in a resident clinic versus the community practice, and what does precepting really even mean? Um, so precepting really is kind of the supervision of the delivery of clinical care. So you're, it's, it's that clinical teaching um, in the room, at the bedside, or in the hall, outside of the room, is, is, or in your office when residents are seeing patients and come in to talk to you. So to me, that, that's what precepting means, is, is you are um, kind of overseeing, directing, and teaching the, the provision of clinical care. Uh, in a residency clinic, um, really your more your role as a preceptor is more of a watching, guiding, answering questions, really overseeing that care that's being provided. The care is actually being provided by the resident. Um, they're the resident's patients. Um, you, as a faculty, you have responsibility for the care that's being delivered. So in a, in a sense, they're your patients as well. But but truly, those, those patients are assigned to the residents. They're the residents' patients. They're pa the residents are the ones going in, seeing them, coming back out, talking to you. You may or may not see all of those patients with the resident. Um, in fact, probably you won't see all of those patients with the resident. In a community practice, I, I guess I kind of see that more as you are including a learner in the, the clinical care that you're providing. So that precepting looks different based on the level of the learner. So you, you have a third year, um, third year medical student on their very first rotation, you might, they might be doing a fair amount of shadowing initially. Um, and then that, that, that uh, escalates all the way up to um, what I call leapfrogging. So often if I have a fourth year medical student with me, um, I'll go see one patient and I'll send them in the room to see the next patient. When I get done, they come out, we talk about the patient they saw, and then I go in and see that patient with them. And then we come out and we just keep leap, leapfrogging through the, through the uh, schedule that way. So I see that, that role in a, in a community practice really more, like I said, in, including the learner in, in the care that you are providing. But, but really, they're your patients, you're seeing all of them, and you are um, responsible for that direct provision of care. That sounds, yeah, that's great. Um, and Dr. Rudder, when a physician decides to be a preceptor and in, engage in teaching, how does the precepting affect their clinic's function and their productivity? That's something we often hear questions about. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And as somebody who works with, uh, particularly with the second portion of what uh, Dr. Freelove mentioned, working with medical students, really the expectations depend on the level of the learner. So. Um, you know, something like the process that Dr. Freelove mentioned about leapfrogging is a great way to continue to see patients in an efficient way, but also provide the learner with an opportunity to hone their skills and practice their skills at the same time. So if it's done well, um, a preceptor with the proper training can really be excellent. Um, it's, very efficient and provide excellent care, the students at the end of the day want, and the learners, whether they're residents or students, want to be functional. They want to be um, part of the provision of care. And so what, as preceptors, what we hope to do is be able to work with a student and give them that independence, but also be able to do that in a very um, efficient way. So there's a lot of ways to learn how to do that. There's a lot of tips and tricks out there. So do you um, you teach about, you know, vital signs and how to check in a patient to a, a learner who's very early on in their career. And then later you have a student um, prep for procedures and do informed consent when they're, you know, moving towards their residency career. So giving the learner different responsibilities based on their skill level that also helps you sort of advance through your schedule through the day. And I think it's also about balancing what you're teaching um, the learner. So are you trying, you don't want to try to teach them the whole curriculum on one patient, but instead offer pearls and little tips and tricks about, oh, whenever I see a patient with X, this is what I typically do in follow-up, as opposed to trying to teach them everything there is to know about disease X, because then the efficiency decreases. So while people worry about clinic function and productivity when they have a learner sort of attached to them. I think there's a lot of ways to make it really valuable for both the preceptor and the learner and ultimately for the care of the patients. 
Mm -hmm. So what it sounds like is there is a lot of skill that's involved in becoming a good teacher. Um, so Dr. Freelove, if a resident or even a med student is really interested in academic family medicine, how can they obtain additional teaching skills and the ability to evaluate and that sort of thing? There are actually a lot of different opportunities and ways to do that. Um, uh, one, I guess, for residents, especially as they're finishing, there are fellowships that are out there. There are places that offer an academic medicine fellowship that you can do an additional year of training. Uh, there are fellowships that are um, kind of longitudinal and home-based learning where you go somewhere for two or three weeks at a time and then go back to your job. So it, that's probably more for somebody who's already become a faculty member or maybe their first year or two of, of doing that and they, they want to enhance those skills and learn more. There are a lot of online resources. I believe we have a list later in, in um, the presentation about what some of STFM's uh, resources are in that, in that realm. Um, there are a lot of conferences that are out there that are specifically around teaching medicine. Uh, and those, the STFM, AAFP, ACGME, LCME, AFMRD, all those, again, kind of the, the alphabet soup in the family of family medicine, there are specific conferences that they offer. Um, and then actually I would say um, go talk to somebody in your, go talk to the chair of the family medicine department. If you're a medical student, you're interested or a resident, um, talk to your program director about it. The residency programs are required to provide structured faculty development. So almost every residency program has something or they are leaning on their, um, their department uh, at the university for that. So there are opportunities locally, I would say, that you should, that if you showed interest and said, hey, I want to learn how to, you know, do precepting, I want to learn how to give feedback, I want to learn how to do these things, um, they, you could potentially be included in, in those faculty, those local faculty development seminars. Great. And I wanted to point out there is, um, on the AAFP website, there is a fellowship directory so people can look into faculty development fellowships by region. Uh, Dr. Ryder, do you think, you know, we're talking about fel faculty development fellowships and, you know, here's how people can get more access to it. Do you think fellowship training is really necessary? Is it kind of optional? What, what's your opinion on that? So I think it depends on the comfort level of the individual applicant or the individual um, person, person that's going into academic family medicine. I think there's a lot of opportunity built into residency training. As Dr. Freelove mentioned, his residents work with students. They're precepting. Um, as a third-year resident, you're supervising interns. You're supervising um, fourth-year medical students. So there's a lot of academic um, learning and opportunity for honing or at least learning and starting those skills as a resident. So depending on your exposure as a resident, I do think you can transition into a faculty position pretty quickly and then continue to find a mentor, work with your department chair, take advantage of these STFM opportunities um, while you're um, gaining the skills um, while, you, while you're working. So I think that faculty development fellowships are right for the right person and for other people, the longitudinal or the um, local um, reinforcement of skills um, might be better. So I think it's very individualized um, for each person, but there's a lot of opportunity out there to find what kind of learner you are um, and to learn those skills in, in different ways. Great, that's very helpful advice. So we will move on to our next participant poll. So here we have a statement, I'm interested in contributing to family medicine through academic scholarship. And we'd love to hear your response, responses. If you strongly agree, if you somewhat agree, if you're not sure about academic scholarship, if you disagree or if you strongly disagree. So go ahead and answer that question. We'll give you a few seconds to respond. Um, so far, everyone is saying uh, strongly agree or somewhat agree. Strongly agree is at 83%, and I'm just waiting for the last few people to put in their votes, and then I will share that, the results with everyone. All right, let's share these. So 86% of people said they strongly agree. They're interested in contributing to family medicine with through academic scholarship. And 14% say somewhat agree. Uh, so we have everyone here is interested in um, 
academic scholarship. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we'll launch into our next section regarding academic scholarship. One question I often hear doctors who are interested in academic medicine, they often ask, do I have to do research or other scholarship, and how much of it do I have to do? Uh, yeah, I hear that question a lot too, actually. Um, and to me, the answer is yes, you, you really have to do it. Um, the real answer is no, you don't absolutely have to, at least in the residency programs. Um, the, the, there is an ACGME requirement that at least some faculty do scholarly activity. Um, but really, I think uh, to truly be a part of academic medicine, you should be doing some scholarship uh, activity. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, the how much is, is variable. Um, as far as how much do you have to do, um, the ACGME does have some guidelines about kind of what they want to see coming out uh, from, a, from a group of faculty. Um, but I, I think um, I think the real hang up there is that so many people um, equate that to pure research and you know they they went into clinical medicine because they did, they wanted to be physician they wanted to, to talk, talk to people touch people and not necessarily do bench research and they don't realize that there are a lot of different forms of scholarship um, that can contribute to family medicine so it's not all just doing clinical research it's it's writing review articles or um, obviously if you do research um, publishing that either through articles or posters but it's presenting it's teaching it's going to national conferences and, and, and presenting on teaching skills uh, as much as a clinical medicine topic um, doing case reports teaching formal courses um, from an ACGME standpoint being involved in committees or in uh, societies that uh, um, further the mission of family medicine at a national level, that counts as scholarship. So there, there are a lot of different things that fall under the realm of scholarship that make it a lot less onerous than I think a lot of people think um, as they're considering academic, as a, academic family medicine as a career. Well, yeah, thank you for defining scholarship, because I agree a lot of people think it just means research, but it really does mean finding a way to advance our specialty of family medicine. So Dr. Rudder, why is it important to not only engage in scholarship, but have a particular um, area of interest, a particular focus of interest? Why is that important? So I think that there's a lot of different reasons why it's important, but one of them is you want to find something that you're truly passionate about. It's going to um, be a chunk of your time in your academic life, in your um, professional life. So find something that is joyful to you, that you're passionate about, um, because it can take a lot of work. Um, and sometimes, you know, sticking with a focus is important, particularly because outcomes and evidence and results can take time. So you want to kind of stick with something so that you can continue to advance that particular area of um, academic family medicine scholarship or research forward. Um, it's also very helpful to be uh, have a focus because it makes you more time efficient. Um, you're very familiar with the background. Um, you start really networking with people who have similar interests, and that might be within your institution, outside your institution, working with people um, across the country that have similar experiences. And once you build that network, the collaboration improves, the ability to work with others improves, the um, building on prior research improves. It also gives you, and we'll get into this a little bit um, next, but it gives you um, opportunity to find funding resources because once you stick sort of within one um, scholarship focus, you'll start to realize that funding opportunities become more apparent, they're a little bit more obvious, and it also allows you to take one input and lead to multiple outputs. And what I mean by that is one particular project that you might be working on could be turned into multiple types of scholarly output. Like Dr. Freelove mentioned, that might be a presentation, it might be a poster, it might be a publication. And how cool is it when you do a publication and you cite yourself, you cite the work of you and your colleagues that you've built on, on work that you've done before kind of moving forward. Um, so I think it's really helpful to have a focus, um, even if you don't know what it is right now, um, to start thinking about what am I passionate about, what am I excited about, what could I see myself continuing to read about, do lit reviews on, um, pay attention to what, you know, what drives me, and, and using that as your focus can be very helpful. 
Mm-hmm. So it sounds like choosing an academic focus really comes down to what your personal passions are. Just to follow up on that, Dr. Rudder, in terms of negotiating time, how does a person negotiate the time to do all this? So the time to engage in research, engage in scholarship, or engage in writing while still balancing their teaching responsibilities and their clinical work? Yeah, I think this is this gets into stuff we'll talk about later too. I think it's important to be upfront. I think when you are first looking looking at jobs and and when you're first um, interviewing at different places and seeing what might be a right fit for you, that it's important to get a sense of what do other people in the department do, what other time is is available, um, or maybe it's over a timeline. Maybe when you first start in a position, you get a little bit of of scholarly time, but then as your career progresses, you're able to revisit that either on an annual or semi annual basis. Um, you know, thinking about those sort of um, uh, opportunities and, and starting kind of up front. Um, and then funding supports your time. So once you find time to um, work on a project, then being able to move forward in uh, with regards to finding opportunities to, to pay for some of that time and, and, and it opens a discussion for you and you can really start by finding a department that has sort of a similar mission to you. I kind of want to go circle back for just one second into sort of talking about um, picking a scholarship focus. And um, it was an interesting question that was just posed that does that sort of go against the philosophy of family medicine primary care where we have a very broad um, focus. I think um, I'm not necessarily talking about a scholarship focus that you're really going to be interested in talking about you know, treatment of urinary tract infections, or you're talking about one very specific thing, but thinking about uh, sort of a realm of focus. Is it going to be in uh, residency teaching? Is it going to be in clinical medicine? Are you going to talk about quality improvements, sort of these different realms of, of scholarship, and, and then choosing within that and building on, and building on prior work to sort of advance, um, advance the knowledge in that area? Thank you. That was a great question from one of our attendees, actually. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. Freelo, in your experience, in terms of the time allocation for teaching versus scholarship versus patient care, other leadership opportunities, serving on, on boards, how is that represented in a person's FTE? So if you can give us a couple examples of how we can either negotiate that or how it really should be distributed, that'd be very helpful. Sure. Well, in residency education, at least, um, to be defined as a core faculty member at a residency program, at least 60% of your time has to be spent in residency activities um, that aren't the deli- that, that aren't you delivering direct care without a resident around. So, um, over half of your time, so 60% of your time. So, if you just let's take a week and break it into 10 half days a week. Six of those half days should be spent on residency activities. And like I said, that's defined as um, pre-stepping in clinic, um, doing uh, didactics or lectures, developing that, advising, mentoring. There's some administrative tasks that could be included in that. So um, 60% of your time, six of those half days a week should be spent doing something like that. Now within that, and that's that's a minimum. Um, I would say just in my faculty, so I have Oh, one, two, three, four, five full-time faculty and one half-time person. And um, within those um, five and a half people, I have um, varying uh, years of experience here. Um, different people have different responsibilities in regards to running our research or uh, quality improvement or in charge of our didactics, um, things like that. So within that, um, it's kind of divided out differently. And that's really I think some of that is dependent upon what the program needs, um, what the demands are of the program, and then also um, what your what your own personal interests are and w- what you can negotiate for. So, um, uh, you know, generally when I have newer faculty that are starting out, I tend to try and put them in clinic um, more than other stuff because I think part of that is just developing themselves as a physician. Uh, we want our faculty to be good physicians, and so having some of that practice experience, I think, is helpful. Um, but then after that, it really does depend a lot more on what are the what is what is that person's interest? What where do they want to go with their career as, as they develop? Do they want to be more along the lines of doing research and quality assessment, quality improvement, and, or is it educational research and they want to spend time um, advising and developing 
other faculty development tools for the rest of the faculty. So um, really, um, while, while there is some latitude there for you from a negotiation standpoint, you should have an idea of what it is that you're interested in doing within the academic side of it. Um, the, hopefully you have, wherever you work, you have a, a good program director who kind of sees everybody's strengths and wants to play off of that and, um, and shifts that work accordingly. That's great. It's really, what I'm hearing mostly is that it's nice to know that there is lots of freedom and flexibility. Definitely once you've learned how to call your resources, get funding from your department, um, and kind of negotiate. It seems like there's a lot of room for negotiation when it comes to academic scholarship. Just absolutely. moving on, I wanted to talk about, go ahead. Absolutely, especially if, you're, if you are adept at finding funding, because if you can find ways to fund stuff, um, that generally frees up time. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's one of the keys I think we talked about, definitely. Um, Dr. Rutter, in terms of finding a good fit, where can people even start to look for positions? I think that's a great question. I think one of the main things that people are talking about is um, where do I where do I fit in? What are the opportunities for me that are available? And I think one of the things to start with is to look at location. Where do you want to be? There's a great need, like we talked about, for academic family physicians. And maybe it's not at your immediate institution that you're at, but maybe there's a community residency nearby. Maybe there's a medical school. Um, that you know is sending students to an uh, off-site location. Maybe there are other things that you can do. So being creative, even within a uh, geographic location, ben can be helpful. But there are always posted positions. So the um, academic um, resources that are listed on this slide, uh, fa Family Medicine Careers, AAFP Career Link, STFM positions are, um, they have a Positions and Opportunity Bulletin that comes out in the back of Family Medicine, which is our uh, STFM journal. There are always um, positions uh, looking for different levels of um, leaders within academic family medicine from junior faculty all the way up to chair positions. But the important thing to remember is that a lot of um, positions are not posted. Remember, it costs money to put an ad in things. And so sometimes it's just easier for programs to um, just kind of wait and see what happens, or they're always sort of an open call or open opportunities for um, a position. So it's important to to call, to, to be up front, to see who's hiring and, and what kind of positions they're working for, whether that's part-time, full-time, um, clinical instructor, which might be sort of an outpatient um, you know, out in the community uh, preceptor for students or residents or um, core faculty, like Dr. Freelov mentioned, someone who physically works, you know, in the same um, uh, clinic as, as, the, as the residents or, or students. Great, thanks. Yeah, I myself didn't even realize how many positions are actually unposted. So when someone finds a position that they are interested in, Dr. Freelove, I know you play a big role in this, but what happens during the interview process, the hiring, and the contract negotiations process? Um, a little bit depends on what the, you know, what the setting is as far as um, is there a big sophisticated HR department that handles a lot of that, or is it a smaller program like mine where the program director is in charge of a lot of that. But in general, there's uh, usually an in initial interview, and that may be with one or just a few people to get a sense of whether this is the right fit for the organization, bringing somebody in. But as the person being interviewed, it's also your first opportunity to say, well, is this something, is this a place that I really want to take that next step with and really delve into deeper? So there's usually kind of an initial interview. If things go well with that, then there's um, generally a second interview, and that typically includes um, a site visit. So that, that initial interview, it may be remote. The second interview is um, generally you're going to go to that program um, and you're going to be there for the day. You're going to probably meet with different, several different interviewers, um, including residents, other faculty, the program director, maybe, maybe somebody from administration. Um, you're going to see the clinic. You're going to see the hospital. You're going to get a much better sense of what the place um, has to offer, uh, what it feels like, um, who the people are that are there. Um, and if there's an offer, then that's really when that negotiation starts, and that's where things might be a little bit different. Some, some places it might be there's an offer made, an offer accepted, some sort of official letter, okay, I've accepted the offer, and then all the rest of it gets done in contract negotiation as far as salary and time allotment and that sort of thing. 
um, or that can all be kind of fluid and happen kind of at the same time. But uh, in general, there's an offer made, a contract um, uh, presented, and then there's there's room within that to negotiate. And I think that's probably important for uh, everybody to, to to remember is when you're looking at this, especially right now when demand is high, you have you have some negotiation room there that you, so you shouldn't just take a contract and sign it without reading it carefully considering what it is that they're saying or wanting out of you or what you're signing and then if there's something in there you want changed come back with with a proposed change yeah that's fantastic it sounds like some of the questions Dr. Freelove kind of touched on that an applicant should be asking themselves is really is this a group that I want to partner with and is this a location that's a good fit for me can I contribute so Dr. Rudder, as far as going back to the interview day, what can an applicant expect on the interview day? And what are some questions an applicant should ask? Great. So I think um, from the applicant standpoint, one of the things that you really want to do up front, again, is talk about time. What are other faculty members doing at this site? Well, how is my time going to be allocated? Um, I think the, the usual things that kind of come along with being a physician, you're going to want to know up front, what's the call schedule like? What are my clinical responsibilities going to be? But then also, what's the time going to be spent for teaching and academics? And am I going to have time to pursue those other things that maybe are drawing you to family, academic family medicine to begin with? I think other things that do come up, um, and uh, Dr. Freeland mentioned this in the contract negotiations, might, you know, going back to that fellowship experience, you know, it, do I need a fellowship to have this job? Do I get a stipend? Will you help me get a fellowship um, in the future if that's something that I decide to pursue? Because there are programs who will add a stipend if a potential faculty member has fellowship experience. So that's something to consider as well when you're considering whether or not to do a fellowship. So it might be worth looking on the job market first and then going back and seeing if a fellowship would be helpful. But I think um, asking about how Will my career progress? What are the expectations for me clinically, um, scholarship-wise? How will my time be spent? And then also, when it's your first job, so a huge portion of the folks that were on um, are on this webinar today are residents or in training. And so what kind of mentorship is available? What kind of feedback am I going to get um, in order to make sure that I'm becoming the best academic family physician that I can um, moving forward? So getting a sense of that is very important. And quite frankly, it's just in a lot of ways not that different from the residency interview process that you've all gone through since I don't think there are any medical students, particularly on this webinar right now, but the um, process of interviewing is are you a good fit for them? Are they a good fit for you? It's feeling each other out. It's seeing what's um, offered, the clinical experience, the academic experience. It's it's all it's taking all of that um, together and sort of seeing, just like you might ask, what do residents do when they graduate? You may want to say, what do faculty do after junior faculty? What what are their career paths that they've been able to take? What opportunities has this position offered to them? Um, and you get a really good sense of, of what um, the expectations might be for you if, if you choose to take that position. Great. Yeah, and Dr. Runner, it sounds like you, you really talked a lot about career progression. Um, so we want to kind of shift into career progression and academic promotion. So the next poll question is the opportunity for academic promotion is important to me. So we'll have you answer if you strongly agree, if you somewhat agree, if you're not sure, if you somewhat disagree, or if you strongly disagree. And so this is academic promotion in terms of assistant professor, associate professor, going to full professor in the residency setting, possibly getting a program directorship. So we'll let a few more people answer that question. So Natasha, 67% of the people strongly agree, and then 33% somewhat agree. So everyone has an interest. Um, in academic promotion and it's important to them and unsurprisingly for most people it's a big issue for them academic promotion. Yeah, so Dr. Freela, in terms of academic promotion um, what is usually assessed in order for people to advance and to get promoted? Uh, it varies a little bit from place to place but uh, in general the things that they look at are what is your current rank and how long have you been in it that would be one of the first things they consider uh, and then they start looking at kind of the things that you've done or accomplished so um, what sort of teaching activities you're involved in and they actually 
want reviews from that. So uh, anytime you give a presentation and there's feedback, you need to save that feedback because they actually are, are looking at that. Um, they'll look at research and scholarship activities, and that could be you know, publications, um, national presentations, posters, grants. Grants is actually a pretty big one for some places. Um, so if you are good at writing grants or securing grants, um, having that uh, in your in your CV is is really in your favor. Um, they'll look at advising and mentoring roles that you've played, uh, who that's for, and what they've gone on to accomplish. And then they look at service, and that service would that could be community service, um, professional service. So, and the professional service could be both what sort of clinical care, what, what patient care related things do you do, as well as other otherwise. So are you involved um, in a national organization or a committee or task force? Um, and then what sort of academic service you provide. Uh, the other thing that, um, depending on what rank you're going for, how high up you've moved, they'll ask for letters of recommendation. And generally, they want those from people outside of your system. So. It's really important as you go to different places and conferences, or if you do a fellowship, those kind of things, you start establishing that network um, of people across the country. That when you, when it's time for you to go for promotion, you can call and say, "Hey, would you write a letter supporting my academic promotion?" Yeah, that's that's great advice right there. But uh, Dr. Rudder, since you are in a university setting, the term tenure. What does tenure mean for academic family medicine? I think that's a great question. I think it will depend on, even within a university setting, what university system you're within. Because in some places, it's extremely important. And in other places, it's less important. And tenure really traditionally um, speaks to job security. So this is really the um, academic uh, equivalent of sort of having job security and staying um, in the same uh, role over time. So basically, um, when you think about your college professors, your English professor, your economics professor, they were very happy when they received tenure because it meant that they could continue um, in that position um, and, and really had very good job security, weren't going to get fired for not publishing or not putting out um, you know, research or things like that. So um, in academic uh, medicine, but particularly in academic family medicine, it's it's possible that tenure maybe doesn't mean as much as it used to. But again, that might be something to really talk about very early on um, with your uh, contract negotiation and or during your interview day. And, you know, typically, like, um, we see that people go from assistant professor to associate professor up to full professor um, using all the criteria that Dr. Freelove mentioned. Um, and that could be over a very varied timeline. Um, and depending on what level you attain or choose to attain, or are able to attain, um, you may get tenure at a certain point on that. Um, another question that's come up is sort of what's the difference between like a clinical professor and an academic professor? And really the difference is dependent on your institution. So here in Albany, one of the things that we have is something called a clinical instructor. And that's really meant to denote somebody who does not have the same um, level of uh, rigor required for their scholarship and research or teaching reviews um, and typically are more uh, in a community outside of the system setting. So it might be somebody the students are with occasionally or the residents are with occasionally as a clinical instructor, whereas typically assistant, associate, or full professor are reserved for um, faculty that are on site and considered core faculty working with the residents or working with the students on a regular basis. But that's just here in Albany. So depending on where you are, the definition of what a clinical instructor or clinical professor might be might be different than an academic professor. And those delineations may be strictly just based on um, scholarship output um, and expectations. So it's a difficult question to answer because it can be very different even in different university settings. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to skip this next poll just in the interest of time, but I want to chat with Dr. Freelove about work-life balance, salary, all of those things. So Dr. Freelove, just starting with what is the average salary for family medicine faculty, and how can an applicant determine if the offer they're getting is fair? Sure. The, the average, so I just, so just, just looked this up. So the average um, base salary, uh, Nationwide is um, ranges around the 150 to 160 range, 160, 150, 160,000 range, with total compensation being more around 175 to 190,000 dollars a year. 
again, that's a nationwide average. Um, there's a, a lot of variability in that. It varies by region, by setting, as a you know a university setting, a community setting, um, size of the practice. Um, there, there are a lot of things that, what do you do? Do you do OB or not? Do you do just outpatient or do you inpatient? So there's a lot of variability in that. So from a resource standpoint, um, the MGMA, Medical Group Management Association, um, has, uh, they do a survey every year um, and put that out and you can look at it and it, you can break it down by type of practice. So it's an academic practice, it's between this many providers and this many providers. It does this many visits a year. There's a lot of different ways to divide that out so that you can hopefully compare apples to apples to see what what a position in a similar setting in your region, what that's paying currently for is fair. But I think I, I threw out both base and total compensation because I think an important thing to think about is that the full benefit package. So. Wins like CME allowance and health insurance and retirement and professional development monies and malpractice and so a lot of those things that are added on as benefits um, that really adds up to a significant amount of money um, when you consider that that package. So so you really need to look at the the total package and not just what that that base salary or, or compensation is. And I think from a benefit standpoint. Um, the, the lifestyle and the flexibility and the family friendliness of being a faculty is a non-monetary benefit that absolutely has to be considered. And I know um, I actually just had uh, somebody graduate this year and, and join residency faculty in part because she wanted to be an academic family, medicine, family physician, but also because of some of the flexibility that we are able to offer her um, through her position with us that she wouldn't have in a private practice. The time off, the ability to, to be flexible with her call schedule and things like that. So there are some non-monetary benefits to doing that that, that I think have to be um, considered. And I, I do think it's more family friendly um, than a lot of private practice situations. Yeah, definitely the work-life balance is something that's important to a lot of people. Um, just in terms of how STFM can help, um, Dr. Rudder, can you chat about some resources that STFM has to help uh, some of our attendees today? Sure. So I think there's a lot of different things, and this slide depicts it beautifully. So you can see that SDFM has a variety of different um, institutes, fellowships, um, or opportunities uh, to really hone those skills in academic family medicine. And so the Emerging Leaders Fellowship, the Medical Student Educators Development Institute, um, a variety of different things, behavioral science, leading change, all these things listed here, really working with the different um, kind of committees and, and opportunities within STFM to, to really hone your skills. And, and even just participating today has really been the um, kind of stepping stone to a variety of other things you can see highlighted at the bottom, the Faculty for Tomorrow Workshop for Residents, um, which is uh, coming up at the end of the month. And I think, Natasha, you have more to say about that. Yeah, so that is actually part of the, it will be right before as a pre-con for the STFM annual meeting, but that will be free for residents. So people who are around should definitely consider attending. There's no fee in attending. Great. So I want to wrap up here. I really want to thank our panelists so much for being here today. If you still have any questions, please use the dialog box and ask those questions. You can also follow up with our organizers and let them know any questions you have and they will pass those along to us. We do encourage that you complete our post-webinar survey online. We are also sending a link of this webinar survey via email so we know what content to provide you for future webinars and we know how to be helpful to you. But thank you all for attending today. We appreciate your time. And Natasha, we don't have any new questions coming in yet, but I'll let you know when they are here. Okay, perfect. Well, I hope everyone has a good day. Thanks.